Good evening. We're on the air once again with another edition of Patience on the News. Something a little different tonight. You know, we usually talk about politics, national politics, uh, main politics, and often have a guest who's a politician. We've had many famous politicians, all of the politicians uh, in Maine, except Susan Collins. She's never agreed to come on the show. I don't blame her. Maybe she doesn't like me. I don't know. But but we've had everybody else. So we even had former Senator Bill Cohen uh, in the last few months. So we kind of stick to politics and public affairs. But we're going to talk about public affairs tonight in another sense. Our guest is Steve DeMillo, who is the manager of DeMillo's Restaurant, member of the iconic family that owns the iconic restaurant here in Portland. And uh, welcome, Steve. Thank you. Great uh, to be here. Uh, we've got a lot of questions for Steve about the hospitality industry in Maine, why they can't find help, what's happening to restaurants, foodie Portland, Portland waterfront, Portland politics, because Steve is a uh, one of the city's uh, activist citizens who pays attention to what's going on, and uh, so we want to uh, talk to him about that. I might even ask him a few questions about his late father, who uh, was really something, and uh, started the restaurant, and uh, uh, was a friend of mine. So, Steve, welcome. Uh, the name of the way to give a title to these programs, and this is uh, uh, Portland, a waterfront, past and future uh, of the waterfront, and what's happening with the hospitality industry today. So uh, you're, you have many brothers and sisters, correct? I'm one of nine. One of nine. And what year were you born? 1960. So in 1960, your father did not have this fancy restaurant. He did not. He had a little small place up on the up on the hill. Up on Bunjoy Hill, Fourth Street, on Fourth Street. Yeah. And uh, but he went into the Navy. I know he left high school, went into the Navy, um, was brought up on, as he used to tell me, Newbury Street, which was the Italian neighborhood, right? Correct. Were his parents Italian immigrants? They were. They both immigrated through Canada. Yeah. As did a lot of the Italians and settled in the city of Portland. A lot of men ended up uh, in Rumford and Jay at the mills because they were stonemasons. But right. uh, my people came right to Portland. To Portland. And um, and when he got out of the Navy... Excuse me, Harold. Army. And he would not like it if you said Navy. Okay. He was army. in the Army. He was a soldier. No, we my two brothers <laughs> that served in the Army also. Okay. So he's a, he, he was a soldier. And then he came back home and... He was apparently just naturally entrepreneurial. Wants to be in, wanted to be in his own business. Yeah, he you know he opened his first business when he was 13 years old. A kind of a corner store, sold candy, had a pinball machine in it, uh, and he was uh, looked after and befriended by uh, several people in the neighborhood, including Harry Baker. So, what what do you attribute this kid, who really the only th the, on the 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 work he did, which was hard work was running his own businesses from the very beginning. Yeah. Well, he was, uh, he was one of six, and he grew up poor, and he didn't want to be poor. And he knew, you know, he had plenty of intelligence. He was not book smart, right. did not read, did not go to school uh, very long. Uh, but he knew that he didn't, he knew there was a better way. And he figured it out. He did figure it out. And you say he wasn't uh, book smart. He didn't finish high school, but... Imagine, I, re re I have here something that you gave me some time ago, an article from Greater Portland Magazine, spring of 1985, 35 years ago, 36 years ago. And there's a feature piece about your dad. It was after he opened the floating restaurant. A big picture, the Tony DeMillo interview. And... Uh, what really interested me, this is 1985. He said, in the summertime, we serve 13 or 1,400 meals a day. And in the wintertime, when it's slow, 600 a day. We're the busiest restaurant in the state of Maine. Well, to create and run and op successfully operate a uh, restaurant that's the most successful in your state, you have to be very smart because you have a lot of things to think about. 
So this, he was gifted. He was gifted. Uh, multitasker would be an understatement, uh, but he also surrounded himself with great people. That was important to him? It was. And so now you're the uh, manager, and but you work and you're a team with many family members, right? Correct. You have five, five of the nine kids in my family uh, work on the property. Uh, my, uh, you know, my brother-in-law runs the kitchen along with the chef, a long-time uh, kitchen employees. Uh, she, the chef and her husband have been there for 20 plus years. Uh, my kids work there. Has some nieces and nephews working through college there. So it's a big family, uh, big family fair, but also long-time staff uh, that stay with us because it's a fun place to work and we pay people well. This is truly a family business. Mm. To, and that's the other nice thing that your father created. He created not just a business, but a family business. He did. He was really proud of that. Uh, his sisters worked, you know, my aunts worked uh, the front desk for 60 years. My mother worked the front desk for many years after her final child went off to college. And, uh, and I remember your aunts and your mother being down there, absolutely. <laughs> they were a great presence. Yes, your mother's still living. My mother is still living. She has dementia, but uh, she still knows us, which is fun. And, uh, yeah, that's, we, that's we reminisce. So your father was the son of Italian immigrants. What was your, what, your, your mother's uh, heritage? My mother's people came from PEI. From Prince Edward Island? Correct. Were they Scotch? They were Scotch. They were farmers. They were stoic, hardworking, nice people. Yeah. All right, so now we talked a little bit about, uh, Steve, uh, 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 about your family, but uh, what about you? Do you know how to cook? I know how to cook. I spent, uh, well, I started in 68 uh, summers washing pots and pans. I'm really good at washing pots yeah, and pans yeah. and dishes. And then my dad uh, put me on a, as a prep cook and then a line cook, fry cook, uh, broiler cook. And so that was, uh, I, I was in the kitchen until I graduated high school in 78. And I put a tie on and came out front. So... When you walk into the kitchen, you know what's going on. I do. I can't do it like them, though. We have some really good people, talented people. And our menu has been uh, uplift, you know, upscaled or uplifted I, over the years. Uh, Chef Bouchard has taken it to another level. And so, you know, I don't think I could work the saute station. I'll try, but I, don't, I won't do a good job at it. So how's DeMillo's doing today? Well, we're doing good despite the pandemic we had you know we were closed down for a couple of months like everybody was uh, March of uh, 20 but then it came back it came back pretty strong up until uh, a year ago you know like last October November uh, things pe the, the numbers came up the COVID numbers came up the cases came up in Maine and uh, people started hunkering down um, but we've done well we have a very stable workforce uh, could use some more people uh, just one of our good cooks just moved back with her family up to Orrington because she wanted to be with her family, and there's absolutely not one person applying for that job. So we've made do. The chef has altered the menu to, uh, to accommodate the talent that she has. Can't just have that saute guy get all the, all the orders on, uh, on a ticket, so it's got to be spread out. Engineer, it's kind of menu, menu engineering. Well, we hear about uh, restaurants, Portland, you know, famous foodie town, famous for its restaurants. And what we hear is all the restaurants are having the same problem. They can't get help. But it sounds to me like the focus is in the kitchen. It is. I mean, that's the heart of the house. So, you know, a lot of our neighboring friends, a lot of the successful restaurants in Portland are chef owner operated. A lot of friends, we're friendly with the, almost all of them. And um, so they're holding down the fort themselves in the kitchen and they create the cuisine and serve it. Uh, but they, you know, we need, we need uh, ancillary staff. We need dishwashers. We need prep cooks, uh, not so skilled labor. That, but they, they get the minimum wage now. Do they, is the minimum wage applicable in Portland? Well, the, the market, because of the staffing shortages, the market has driven the wages up tremendously. Yeah. I mean, we hire a dishwasher at 18 bucks an hour now. Yeah. Because you're not going to get one if you offer 17 yeah. or 16. Otherwise, nobody's going to come yeah. work for you. Yeah, if you want them. And yeah. therefore, our prices have stayed up. We had hoped to bring our prices back down, but uh, yeah. you know, we're there to make money, keep the place going. So uh, at almost $20 an hour uh, dishwashing, uh, if they work 40 hours a, a week, that's 800 a week. Yeah. Uh, and you can't get people. Correct. Why? Um, it's a combination of things. People have, f f I think, found another way to make a living. Uh, 
Hospitality is not for everybody, but it is certainly a fun way to make a living. Uh, hospitality positions allow uh, you're like a skier. I, I don't wait in line. I don't ski on a Saturday or Sunday. I ski during the week when there's no line. So there's a lot of benefits to it. The the you know a lot of our staff uh, are students. They're at college. They might be at my main college of art or SMCC or University of Maine, and they're able to work you know 20 hours a week, 25 hours a week, still make a good living and and have some flexibility in their life. So uh, that's so that's 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 part of it. Uh, but what about what about servers? I mean, it's servers now. I don't quite understand. I read in the newspaper what was happening with tips and mm -hmm. whether tips are included or mm -hmm. fifteen dollars. But what does a server make? Does a server make the minimum wage, or do they have a different arrangement? In, in Maine, there's a tip credit is allowed, so they'll make half of the minimum wage right. plus tips. But they're the highest earners in in the restaurant. The highest earners of any restaurant anywhere. I mean, if they make six oh eight an hour that we paid them they're making $50 an hour when they combine it with their tips. Right. So it's, uh, we, we don't feel sorry for the way So a, a server in a good restaurant, and in one of the, the, the good restaurants in Portland, can make much more than a thousand a week. Oh, yeah, by far. A couple of thousand a week. Correct. And, but a lot of them choose not to work that many hours. They like to travel. They yeah. like to have fun. Uh, so they can work a short amount of hours and make good money. Yeah. One of the other challenges we had with bringing people back to work were, was, was the, uh, the safety aspect of it. People weren't comfortable maybe being working uh, among others, unmasked. You can't really social distance in a kitchen right, right next to each other. Yeah. And then, of course, the extra uh, unemployment money has uh, added to that, uh, to that the staffing shortage. We right. don't know how, how many people will come back to work after. But the, the elimination of that extra uh, unemployment money We'll come at a time where it's the end of the summer. There might have been some people that saved some money last year because they didn't do anything, and they took the summer off. So maybe they'll be maybe. back in the workforce. I talked to a fellow who's in the staffing business, uh, and uh, he anticipates in the fall there'll be more people wanting to come back to work. I think he's right. You think he's right? I yeah. Am. Yeah. So uh, what about business this summer? As Opposed to gangbusters. I mean, the, the street is just crawling with people. I don't know an operator. I'm, I'm the uh, chairman of the Hospitality Maine organization. I don't know a, a member of ours in any part of Maine that is not breaking records this year. I talked to a big hotel operator. I have many hotels in Maine as well as other places in the country. And uh, this, was, uh, this was probably a month ago, a month and a half ago the end of June. And uh, he said, we've never seen anything like it. He said, people will come to our hotels in the, on the weekend, for instance. We could charge them anything. They'd pay. Mm -hmm. He said, it's, it's just unbelievable. And then I drive down Commercial Street, people everywhere. Yeah, I, I often think, I wonder what my dad would think of that, because he, he's been gone 22 years, so he yeah. didn't really see that. Uh, well, well, Portland was not a tourist destination when your father died. You are correct. Is now big? Is it a big tourist no, destination? Oh, it's huge. It's huge. Um, you know, uh, the, the the establishment of it being a foodie city, uh, the Bon Appetit designation, the best place to live, all those things have helped. But the thing is, when folks come here for a culinary experience, they get it. I mean, I don't travel a whole lot, but if I'm in Chicago or Boston or New York or Washington D.C., which I go every year for the Public Affairs Conference, I know I don't want for anything more than I've already got in Poland. It's all over the place. Now we're getting to the citizen involvement. You just <laughs> triggered something with me. You said you go to Washington for a Public Affairs Conference. Mm -hmm. What kind of a Public Affairs? For the NRA. Yep. Restaurants, not rifles. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we we, we uh, well across the country. Uh, every state restaurant association, or hospitality, ours is Hospitality Maine, sends their representatives, their government affairs people, yeah. their, uh, ch their chief people, anybody who's interested in participating in, right. in politics. We go and we visit the Hill and we visit, we only have four visits. I'm sure when you're in California, you've got a lot more visits to, yeah. to make. But we go, uh, we visit all of our legislators and uh, right. been doing it for years. So even, even, even our representatives that 
we know don't agree with what we're asking yeah. them to support. They're cordial, they're friendly, they're helpful, and... and uh, you like uh, this. I do like this. Uh, my, my dad was always politically active, uh, but I, I'd have to say my, uh, my, my political mentor was Dick Groton, and Dick Groton um, coined the phrase, or I think he coined it, politics is not a spectator sport. Well, I ought to explain. Dick Groton was the longtime, was it Maine Restaurant Association? Correct. Well, long, long time uh, executive director of the Maine Restaurant Association and a very well-known person on the, in the halls of power in Augusta. And a developer before that, and a great guy. Yeah. So you worked with Dick a lot. I did. And you learned stuff from him. I learned a lot from him. Yeah. In fact, you're, you're a very active citizen in Portland. People know you, and you're active. You ran for the... Uh, uh, you, you ran to be uh, elected to the Charter Commission in the city of Portland recently, and you got a lot of votes, but <laughs> you got a lot of votes. How many votes did you get? I got 1,848 first place votes. Now, 1,848, there weren't many total number of people that voted in that election. You, you are correct. Uh, so you, you must have gotten more than a lot of other people. I, got, I was the second Second highest, uh, vote second vote highest in yeah. the statewide, uh, citywide. Uh, in that city, in the in the at large race. So well, I was just citywide. Of, correct. So you were the second largest. Yes. And um, and uh, are there people on that that did get elected to the commission? They got fewer votes than you. Uh, well, I'm not, I know that uh, Commissioner Washburn, uh, when they uh, when they applied rank choice voting, uh, she well, he had 367. Uh, first, first place class votes. votes. First, first place votes. And now she's on the commission, and I'm not. You had 1,800 and some, and she had 300 and some. <laughs> she's on, and you're off. That's ranked choice voting for you. So you don't like ranked choice voting? Uh, I don't, but I, I, I'm told that maybe the the uh, the city applied the wrong the wrong metrics because there were four candidates for uh, excuse me, ten candidates for four at large seats. Yeah. So, would I do it differently this time? Well, next time, I certainly would. They ran a slate of uh, candidates, which that's what you do with ranked choice voting. Us run-of-the-mill normal people uh, that are not, you did call me an activist, but I'm not an activist. We don't know these things, so now we yeah. know. So now, as the... Well, uh, I don't see any difference between activists and, and uh, involved citizenship, because even, I don't agree with much of the democratic socialists position uh, at all. I disagree with much of it. I don't think it's realistic. But they're active citizens. And in self-government, democracy depends on citizens being active. I mean, I'm a, I'm a Greek. I've read a lot about the ancient Greeks. And uh, it was citizen participation. They were activists, those ancient Greeks. Mm -hmm. So we call everybody an activist. It gets a bad name. If some people are, uh, you know, a charge into the Capitol with flags and guns to be activists. Yeah. We don't agree with that. But be Before we leave the Charter Commission discussion, I just want to point out that the low voter turnout, which we knew was going to be a factor because it was in June, uh, it's just tra traditionally it's not a good time to get voters out, uh, but the, uh, the conservative or the moderate voter did not come out. And the other side, the Democratic Socialists of Portland, yeah. they were very good at getting the vote out. Yes. And so they, I still say they're the vocal minority. Yeah. John Q. Public, there's way more of them that just want their taxes to be lower. They want a manager, council form of government. They don't want a strong mayor to be ruling over all the department heads. Uh, but they need to come out this, next, this coming November. They need to come out. And vote. I would say they need to come out, and I, if they no, no one is organized as well as the Democratic Socialists, and I think a little, if there's people that don't agree with their positions, the other, those people need to organize as well. You know, messaging, of course, we all know is important, and these people, these Democratic Socialists had a message when it came to the Charter Commission, and that is that the council manager form of government, it was a product of racial bias and something supported uh, supported by the Ku Klux Klan. And that is absolutely untrue. It's just 
No, it's a, I, it's a lie. Correct. It's not true. Correct. The fact is that the council manager form of government was a reform proposal. People, good government people, League of Women Voters, were for the council form of government because they didn't like the corruption in the strong mayor, uh, 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 strong mayor governments. So it was it was reformers, not and not not Ku Klux Klaners, who came up with a council manager form of government and sold it in many places across the country. Um, so uh, I, unless you have better message, and I'm not talking about you personally, yeah. but unless those who uh, don't agree with the democratic socialists and don't want them to control uh, what's in the charter and what kind of a government Portland will have, the message has to be clearer. You are correct. Yeah. So um, let's talk about uh, some of the other things. The waterfront, the whole issue in the waterfront over the years, once development pressures began, uh, and really once your dad put that, put, put his floating restaurant down there with a big parking area, how many acres of par parking do you have? There's three acres there, and then uh, there was four acres of water, but um, yeah. it was deemed to be belonging to the state. He was, he was sold the acreage, the water acreage. Yeah, but he has to lease it from the state. Well, he didn't know that when he bought it. Oh, he didn't know that. The bank sold it to him as X number of acres on land and X number of acres of water. He didn't I'm know that. I'm smiling because he was very friendly with that bank. <laughs> he was. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, yeah, so you have the marina, which occupies a lot of the water space, mm -hmm. and very successful marina, too. Mm -hmm. And um, and you, have, do you, do you, you, you do boat sales. You boat, have boat sales in some place north of Portland? Sure. My youngest brother, Chris, uh, has DeMillo's uh, yacht sales, and he has offices in uh, uh, Maryland. Uh, he has a nice facility up in Freeport. Oh, wow. Uh, Long Island, New York, uh, he, Kittery. He's got the DeMillo entrepreneurial gene, he's too. He's got it better than anybody, I think. Yeah, he does really well. He's very smart, very astute. Loves uh, loves the challenge of business, so he's he, he's involved in the in boat sales up and down the Atlantic coast. Correct. He's the most successful saber yacht dealer uh, on the eastern uh, in, the, in the country, I guess, because the eastern seaboard is really their market. Wow. Yeah. Big. Well, that, I didn't I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, but you have the you have the big marina there. Um, you have you've been the big boat place. Now there's another alternative. For big boats, but it's yep. it's a longer walk to the restaurants. Uh, well, the the, uh, the developers of the uh, Fort, uh, Fort Portland, uh, the uh, East End. Uh, yeah, it's the Port. What do they call it? Portland the, Company. Yeah, the, the the folks that are developing that they're they're uh, they're going to lease out space to restaurants. They're trying to come up, cr uh, create their own community. Yeah. Residential restaurants, shops. Right. So that's another destination. So. It's nice to see this summer when you talk about the large yachts. It's great to see because they, their, their marketing was that if we build it, they will come, and they were correct because we could only handle so many of them. And right. my brother manages that, um, the dockage at, at uh, DeMillo's, and, uh, you know, he's at capacity, well, always was at capacity. Uh, but now there's just more of those mega yachts, and it's great to see. So, so this tension, back to this issue of tension between the working waterfront, so-called, on one hand, and the hospitality industry, r r restaurants and hotels on, on the other hand, um, is there, you, you folks talk back and forth. Sure, we're all friendly. Uh, both sides are, are, are trying to look out for their own turf, so the lobstermen, or, or the, the harvesters, but it's mainly lobstermen that are involved in the, in the discussions. They don't want to lose their birthing. They don't want, you know, a hotel or a restaurant to displace their their workplace. And they have legitimate concerns that once a, a upland use or a restaurant gets located next to their lobster boat, then eventually they'll be talking about the stinky bait and the loud engines early in the morning and all that goes on. So uh, I don't blame them, but there's room for everybody. And it really goes back to uh, when my dad bought Long Wharf in 1978, and 
pretty much everything on the waterfront was uh, uh, either established businesses. Uh, you remember Shirtliff was down there and uh, A.R. Bishop and well, there was still Boone's. Boone's was there as a restaurant from the turn of the century. But most of the, most of the wharves were falling in disrepair. You had the, um, you had the, the Poole family run in Union Wharf, which is really the kind of the poster child for a, a well-run marine wharf. Uh, but then you had Long Wharf, like what my dad bought. And it was derelict. It was a burnt-out coal pier. Uh, so he developed it slowly, built the, the marina. He opened it in 79. And then he was going to build a restaurant in the parking lot. Um, and we had been uh, diagonally across Street 121 from 65 until 82. We moved over to the boat. Uh, That's a pizza place now, isn't it? Uh, it was. It was uh, Angie's Pizza for Angie's a lot of pizza, years. Right. Now it's uh, Seabag's uh, flagship oh, store. Oh, Seabag's store. So they just store, took yeah. it over, and which is uh, great people in that business too. Uh, but you know, so him developing Long Wharf probably wouldn't have been a problem, but it's Chandler's Wharf that was the lightning rod. And if you think back to the- Michael Liberty. You got it, Michael and David uh, Cope, uh, David Liberty Cope. Group, yeah. uh, and all that were involved, they, they developed that, was Central Wharf at the time, they changed it for marketing reasons. Uh, they, you know, from pier's edge to pier's edge, building and structures, and it didn't allow any- Scared people. It did scare people, and it got them going. Maybe there was a yeah. moratorium on development. Right, right, right. Uh, had a referendum. Correct, uh, back in the early 80s. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, I understand where they're coming from, but there's room for everybody, and I think we've, we've proven that. Well, and I think that uh, over the last uh, couple of decades, uh, that's worked out pretty well. There is kind of a synthesis of the two things. I know that, uh, at the Pierce Atwood Law Firm building, which is on a pier next to the Portland Fish Pier. But you walk out, you come out the front door of the Pierce Atwood Law Firm, and there's a dozen lobster boats lined up there. That's where yeah. they berth. Yep. I think it's worked out for them, and I don't think it bothers Pierce Atwood in the least. You are correct. They're cohabitating just, just fine. Just fine. Yeah. So I think that's where we arrived ultimately in Portland is a sharing. I think you're right, and I think, uh, well, one of, my, uh, one of my friends that really has been more active in waterfront zoning than myself uh, uh, was, is Charlie Poole from Union Wharf. Right. Uh, and he, was, uh, he just always said, we need, we need mixed use. Yeah. So on his wharf, he needed upper floors to be able to put offices in. Right. They pay for the infrastructure of the pier. So uh, that that pier is a nice, solid pier now, but they couldn't have done it without some other uses. Correct, and it and and the the rents for the lobstermen have to stay reasonable, and that's uh, yeah. that's the whole uh, ballet that's being danced yeah. uh, on those piers. Yeah, yeah. See, practical solutions. It's uh, uh, there are always practical solutions, but not everybody in the extremes is willing to look in the center where the practical solutions emerge. Well, you are correct, and that's, that, that was the last go around with the waterfront zoning is that there was a threat of another moratorium. So the, uh, the Batemans were gonna develop uh, Fisherman's Wharf at the head of Chandler's Wharf. They were gonna develop a hotel there. Yeah. And uh, the work, uh, working waterfront people came out of the, you know, came out of the woodwork and they, they threatened a, a moratorium and our city manager got together with the representatives from the working waterfront people, uh, um, actually in Keith Lane's kitchen um, up, in the, up on Monjoy Hill. And they had is a- Is he a lobsterman? He is a lobsterman, a yeah. great guy on a Custom House Wharf. So uh, Willis Spear, um, John Bizonet, uh, Keith Lane, all very active, and a lot of other- uh, Fishermen. Fishermen, yep. Yep, and they, uh, they, they uh, brokered a deal with the city manager that we'd, uh, you know, we'd halt all uh, development for now, and let's discuss it. Uh, hence, the city manager's uh, waterfront working group, of which I serve, uh, as do uh, several of the lobster men, pier owners, business people in, in the area. So it's a nice uh, combination of people all talk of to each other, correct, and try to work things out in a civil manner. In a, in a civil manner. Ah, you added that <laughs> in a civil manner, yeah. which is. Uh, uh, not always the case these days. No, it's too bad. I mean, because as much as we are appear to be adversaries, uh, say property owners and lobstermen, you know, when we'd get through with these meetings, we'd go out and have a beer afterwards. Right. We're friends. You know, we we see each other socially. Um, 
It, it's a nice group of people, and they, like I said, they're just trying to protect their turf, their, their livelihood. Now, the other change is hotels. I mean, uh, I was talking to somebody the other day, I think I mentioned this to you earlier, that told me there are now, with the opening of the new hotels on Commercial Street, 3,000 rooms on the peninsula. And you can't get a room on a weekend here. It's craziness. And you can't, there are 3,000 rooms, and if you come up here from New York or whatever, mm -hmm. you want to, you can't get one. And they're getting New York prices. And they're getting New York prices, and it, and it pours over to other things. My, my wife works at a woman's dress store on Exchange Street, not far from the Press Hotel. The business they do is strongly tied to the Press Hotel. People come out of the hotel, they walk down the street, they go in, they like what they see. Uh, the, the tourist industry is just fueling yeah. Portland economically. Yeah, it's burgeoning. Well, you know, what, where she works, I don't, I don't know what shop it is, but it's the beauty of the Old Port Exchange, or it was called the Old Port Exchange, right. but, our, but our area, now it's expanded down to Commercial Street. There are shops that are offering something that they can't, they're unique, they're unique items. You That's can't exactly get them everywhere. what happens to them. I said, where do the customers come from? Texas, California, Missouri, Chicago. It's a significant portion of their sales are to those people. And then they hear from those people sometimes, well, can you send me this or can you send me that? Good for them. Yeah. No, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's really unusual. People don't realize, a lot of the people, because I'm old, I'm 85, so... Uh, People don't realize that what in the eight in the nineteen sixties, you walk down the port, old port. You had to be careful. It was a bad area. Sure was. You were worried there might be a knife fight or something You're down right. there. Yeah. There was it, it was not a place to hang out. It was not and, the Iron Horseman had their uh, clubhouse up on Fourth Street. Yes. Yeah. That's well, my right. dad def befriended them because he needed them to be on his side. Yeah. He okay. befriended everybody. Really? Tony DeMello was friendly with the guy that picked up the trash in the morning and the bank president. Yeah. He, didn't like, he truly liked people, but he knew he needed everybody. Yeah. Well, I know he was friendly with the bank president because I knew the <laughs> bank president. <laughs> they, had, they had a fun time together. Yes. But, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's just changed dramatically now. I went up to City Hall one time. Uh, it was a big brouhaha over something at a city council meeting. And there was a huge crowd of young people. Uh, most of them, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing most of them didn't grow up around here. But they moved here and we're happy they're here. And, uh, but one guy stood up and he said, we got to do something to get rid of these out-of-state developers. These people who want to come in here and, he says, buy our town. Now, I knew he hadn't been around very long. And I had this urge when he was finished, to grab him by the ear, <laughs> march him to the window, and point out the, out the window and say, you like this town? You say you like this yeah. town. Wouldn't be here unless people invested money in it. Good. Just wouldn't be here. You're right. You're right. From the time the villages became towns and towns became cities, it took people risking money, their own money, to do this. But they don't think of that. They don't realize that, and they want to stop things. And had they stopped things in the 1960s in this town, it would be a far different place and much less attractive to the young man who made that speech. You are correct. And I, and I um, you know, to take it one step further, uh, I, I said I couldn't wait for my first uh, waterfront working group with the city manager and my lobsterman friends. My first statement to them was, because they, they were in a slump, all during the pandemic, they weren't selling. They weren't. They weren't selling lobsters. Yeah. They weren't selling lobsters because everything shut down. And but well, one of their major complaints is not just uh, providing dockage for their for their uh, people in the business for their industry, but it's traffic on Commercial Street. They don't like that they now have to wait to get from point A to point B in traffic. But I brought to their attention, gentlemen. I said, there's a correlation between. You selling lobster in that traffic. You got to have both. We laughed about it. I made my point. 
But, but, yeah, but it seems to me a very good point that uh, you sell a lot of lobster in your Correct. restaurant. Right. Probably as much as anybody in the state. You don't know, but. I don't know, but a lot. But a lot of the restaurants in the neighborhood yeah. sell lobster. But you, people come to a floating restaurant on the main seacoast, they think lobster. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and every time you make a lobster sale, it's good for those lobstermen. Exactly. That's the point I was making. Yeah. I took you off task a little bit. You were talking about development, and I, I, I yeah. immediately thought of the eastern waterfront where we have that uh, kind of a rapid expansion of, of development. A uh, lot of office buildings down there. Boy, the big time. And big that, time. Yep. And, the, and, and condos. Yeah, and the developers of the uh, Four Points Marina and then the upland uh, yeah. buildings. It's all good. I mean, I have the... Uh, I happen to have a, a wife who disagrees with me on that. She does not like all that. She doesn't want all those big buildings. She drives through there. She said, we might as well be in Boston. I'm like, it's good. It's progress. It's well, more. Well, there's a little difference, too, between Portland and Boston and many other cities. Not all cities. Portland is almost an island. It's a peninsula. Mm -hmm. And there's not a lot of space on that peninsula. Is the limited. So in terms of downtown Portland, you can never have it will never sprawl too much mm -hmm. because there's no place to go. The only place to go now is West Commercial Street, where the Veterans Building is being constructed mm -hmm. now on the west side of the bridge. But uh, otherwise, Portland is a very contained place. Seawater on three sides of Portland, so it's very contained, uh, and the peninsula. There's no room for sprawl. The sprawl is be in South Portland or Scarborough Correct. or Westbrook, Correct. but not in Portland. So uh, Portland will never get too big. Can't. There's no, no room. Uh, you know, but then it's, it's not just, you know, the people that like Portland the way it used to be. My yeah. wife moved here in 77. It's not the same Portland or at, le at least the downtown right. waterfront, isn't it? But, uh, you know, we also have the Islanders who have a legitimate concern about parking. That's true. Yeah, it's a big issue for them. Yeah. And there's more island. There's more people living on those islands than ever. Than ever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so they are dependent on the ferry and the parking garage next to the ferry. And it's that that parking garage, I guess, is full all the time. Oh yeah. Yeah. You're on a long waiting list. But waiting list. There were surface lots that the city owned, and they they they've got one open right now for a, a daily pay, fifteen dollars yeah. a day, which is reasonable. Uh, but that'll be developed here eventually. The city's got uh, some grand plans for. Uh, a nice uh, Portland uh, park, a waterfront park down there by. Down where the ferry terminal used Correct, to. between yeah, the, the Ocean Gateway the, and. The uh, Nova Scotia ferry terminal. Correct. Yeah. Yes. And, uh, They've got some great plans for down there to, uh, to offer more public access to the water. But it, it is coming to the cost of uh, parking for our islanders. It is. But overall, Portland, the amenities in this city are uh, extraordinary for a city its size. There are very few places in America with the amenities that have been developed here in the last 40 years, very few places in America that can match it in terms of lifestyle, amenities, and so forth. You know, the, like, for those who don't want it to be developed too much, you got the fact that the peninsula is limited in space. There's not much room for much more development. Correct. And the climate. Fact of the matter is that climate always has and always will be a kind of governor on development. It'll never get too great because people don't like cold weather. No, I think you're right. But but it is spreading a little bit. I mean, look at the, the news that with Berman Morrill moving out, all those jobs. And I haven't heard how many jobs are leaving, but that's going to be replaced by the Rue Institute with the, you know, collaboration with Northeastern University. So that's it's going to be replaced by many st hundreds of students who do not live here now, that come here to go to school. Hundreds of students, they're going to spend many, of, they're all graduate students, and they're learning to be entrepreneurial, they're learning to develop new science and, and new businesses. I think it is, you know, it's replacing factory workers with, but with jobs that some kid growing up it goes to Deering High School, or you went to Deering High School that uh, has been confronted with the fact that unless you have your own business, you might end up 
working in Philadelphia, that kid's going to go to college and come back to, to Portland and work in a job that pays well. So I, I'm, I'm very excited about uh, the Rue Institute and, and the Burnham and Morrill place. The, that site, Burnham Morrill site, as you cross the bridge with the Back Bay on one side and the Casco Bay on the other side, and that site is one of the best sites I've ever seen in any city. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's, a, it's, it's spectacular. A, yeah. And I didn't mean to speak uh, b bad about that. No, I no. Lo love those folks, and it's definitely bringing some new excitement. In oh, I think to the, uh, yeah, I, I think it's going to stimulate jobs. But there's the housing issue too. There is the housing issue, and uh, that's true. And there is a crisis of housing with the cost that so many people can't afford uh, rents mm -hmm. and so forth. But Supply and demand is always affects those things. So the supply is restricted, and no matter what any, the city council does, unless the, the restriction in supply is alleviated, they can't fix it. You can pass laws, you, know, you can try to cap rents, you can do yep. all those things, just means fewer housing. The, the, the more ca you cap the rents, the fewer new housing units will be built. So, but, you build enough of them, now they're starting to work now on a high-rise apartment house, the tallest in Maine. I see that. Yeah, uh, in downtown. Well, those kinds of things alleviate the housing crisis because the more you build, the less price pressure there is in rents. So, yeah, I believe you're, yeah, I believe you're correct. Um, and and uh, the folks that, they don't like the, that, that the workers have to go to Westbrook or Saco, which is, yeah. those are popular places to go now. Very popular. Yeah, because the price is right. The taxes are lower, I mean, less. our property taxes are Portland. really high here in Portland. They are indeed. Yeah, and that's what's driving, another another reason why it drives the rents up so high. Yes, yeah, no, that, that, that that's, there's no, there's no question about it. But in any event, the bottom line is that for politicians in Portland, for people on the council, people who want to be a mayor or whatever, that uh, it gets funds from only one place. The money to pay for the things they want to do comes from, a, comes from people, from residents, yeah. property taxes, fees, that kind of thing. That's where all the money comes from. Yeah. No development, no money. Simple. That's it. So, uh, so the, the city is partners with people like you. Mm -hmm. You are their partner. Mm -hmm. The more success you have in your restaurant business, the higher value your property has, the more in taxes the city of Portland collects. You are correct. The more it can spend. Pretty simple it equation. Is. So what, what, what worries you about Portland in the next 25 years? What, you, I think the big concerns, I mean, we're doing well. But the things we have to be careful about? Well, homelessness, so the unhoused, it's a big issue. Yeah. So we've got people all, all around the city, the peninsula anyways, that are yes. need a place to live. I don't know the answers. I see a lot of people studying it. A yeah. lot of, uh, you know, I watch the Preble Street organization um, uh, do their best to feed people and to house people and to attend to their needs. You know, the Portland Free Clinic doing their work out there in the health care for the unhoused. Uh, but then there's the debate, where, where's, the next, uh, where's the next homeless shelter? Not in my neighborhood. It's not in my neighborhood. Nobody wants it in the neighborhood. And the, 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 popular, the popular one is the Riverside Street now, but then the city's now going to put it on the, on the uh, ballot. Uh, the, maybe there's a choice between smaller ones or the large one, which is n not very... I don't think it was aptly cited. Some do, um, uh, or, or none of the above. So here's what some people would ask you, and I'll ask in their behalf. You talked about difficulty in getting dishwashers in your restaurant. Joseph Brennan, who grew up in Portland and was uh, for two terms governor of Maine, always said as he went around and campaigned, the best social program is a job. The best social program is a job. That always appealed to me. I always thought Joe's right about this. It's pretty simple, mm -hmm. and he's absolutely right. 
He was right about a lot of things. So um, you're looking for dishwashers, and we're worried. Uh, we're worried sitting here talking about poor people who don't have a place to sleep because they have no money to get a place to sleep. Why don't they come and wash dishes at DeMillo's? No, there's a fair amount of those folks that are, you know, suffering from mental illness, substance abuse. Those are big, big factors in the homeless. Yeah, the homelessness issue. That's, you, you, you now put on the table yeah. a major part of the issue, which is mental health and uh, addiction. And, uh, and it is a mental health issue issue and that's I think what we don't know what the solution is when I was growing up into adulthood mentally ill people were actually treated in mental hospitals mm -hmm. now there was a idea that went around that caught hold that this was cruel to put people in these institutions who were mentally ill when they could be treated with medicine and so the, Everybody went on the street. And some people can't function. And they don't take their medicine. And I don't know what the solution is, but you put your finger on what, 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 why what, the disconnect between you want people to work and these people are on the street. And you said a lot of it is mental health and addiction. Yeah, I have. Uh, I don't know. I don't have the answers. Uh, and evidently, nobody has the, 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 the golden spike to fix the problem. But there's a lot of good people out there working towards it. Um, and if you look, if you talk about workers and homeless or, or panhandlers, uh, you know, both my my brother, one of my brothers, has offered, stopped and offered work to people. We've got some people from that offer. Yeah, my brother-in-law has done it, uh, but. Most people, I don't know, they either enjoy the cash or they can't deal with it mentally. Yeah. Um, going, you know, but you do have been... some people that were down and out that you've given jobs to and they've Correct. come to work. Correct. And worked up the ladder, some of them. Really? Yeah. yeah. So that's because, like... uh, you know, that go then it goes back to the minimum wage thing. Like the minimum wage, not minimum wage was intended to someone to raise their family on, it's right. an entry level wage. Right. Come to work as a dishwasher, work up to a prep cook, a line cook. Yeah. Run the kitchen someday. We'll yeah. train you. Yeah. But now you, you can make eight hundred bucks a week washing <laughs> dishes. So it's times have changed. Yeah. Uh, dishwasher. And, and that, yeah. And I don't think that's bad. The fact is that the more you pay people at the lower end, the more they can put back into the economy. So uh, you, 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 my theory, because I don't own a restaurant, is if you pay them dishwashers eight hundred dollars a week, they can afford to go to a restaurant and buy a meal too. That does help the economy. It does help the economy, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So um, I think. Well, let me ask you this: so your involvement in city politics and public affairs, you think about running? For some office, said, well, run, uh, running for the charter commission w was uh, appealing to me because it was a defined role, a defined period of time. Yeah. Even though it was a little bit flexible as how far out would go, but it was a defined role that I thought would be a great way to give back to my city. Yeah. Um, you mentioned uh, Governor Brennan. Governor Brennan gave me that advice uh, for 20 years ago. Probably he said, "Do not." run for a council seat as a business person. <laughs> Fortunately, the governor and I have had many visits over the years, and I still to this day, uh, he, he visits, uh, and I get to have to get some advice. But he said, you know, if you want to serve people, go to Augusta. You're yeah. going to do nothing but make enemies at city council level as a business person yeah. and a high-profile business person. So now you have on the Portland City Council some people that I believe are moderates, like... Uh, uh, Spencer and Spen um, uh, Nick, Nick, Nick yeah, they're, they're getting off, on, yeah. and he, and so the Democratic Socialists were organized to get those seats. Correct. But those seats, and it's this year, I guess it's in November, so it's an you off are year, correct. District, off year election. Yeah. District one seat uh, uh, being uh, given up by um, um, her name escapes me, but she's oh, also yeah, a, from the Hill. 
also a great, um, yeah, a great she's, moderate. She's candidate. a moderate. Yeah. She is nice person, hard worker, um, thinks outside the box. Yeah. Um, sorry. So, I so her there's name. a. So there's a. There is obviously in government a place for people in the middle that aren't on the extremes. But the problem is that in this city, for instance, the, we talked about the democratic socialists being highly organized. There's no moderate organization. There's no organization of moderates. There are some that are brewing. Okay. So stay tuned. Stay tuned. Okay. <laughs> Belinda Ray. I'm sorry. Belinda sorry, Ray. Belinda. Yeah. yeah. Belinda Ray, uh, seat district number one. Yeah. Uh, Spencer Thibodeau, uh, two. And then there's two, excuse me, on that large seat, uh, Mick, Ma Nick Mavadonis' seat. Those three seats will be up for election in November. Yeah. And their ranked choice voting uh, will be applied yeah. to those races. Yeah. And so if, uh, if we don't want it to be just one group in power, other groups have to organize. Politics is not a spectator sport. Politics is a non-spectator sport. That's right. So, all right, so we're not going to see you running for mayor, that's for sure. No. Bad for business, I agree. Yeah, I think the governor uh, hit the nail on the head, too. But I'm, well, also, I mean, I've been working a lot of hours, long hours, all my life. Um, I want to have some fun. I've got a great family. I love my wife, spending time with her. My kids, my kids work with us. Uh, so you have two grown children? Two grown children, yeah, 38 and 35. Boys? Uh, Steve Jr. is 38, Chelsea is 35. They both work with us. They do? Yeah, they both, they gave us three grandchildren that are just the, yeah. the, so much fun and we're having a great time with them. But look at them, I mean, they're already eight, seven, and three. So before you know it, they'll be in high school and gone off to college. So. I want to catch some of that along the way. Yeah. All right. So you have a lot of things you want to, you want to do. Do you, do you have a boat? Uh, I, I share a boat with my family. Yeah. A boat my dad had built in 1989. It's a Holland. Lobster? Lobster. Yeah. It's a 38 <laughs> Holland, and uh, we love it. We, we really enjoy it. Well, well, your dad had me on that boat a few <laughs> times. Uh, yeah. I, 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 Did he twist your arm and make you drink alcohol? No, he didn't. I, on two occasions, I can remember, I had somebody visiting from out of town, and uh, I called him up and I said, Tony, I, I want to show these people Portland and the harbor and everything. And he says, bring them down, we'll take them out on the boat. Both times, he had a little spread on the boat. Nice. You know, we had a nice lunch and, and so forth. He was a great promoter of the city of Portland. Yeah, he was. A great promoter of the city of Portland. Do you... Do you remember when, of course you do, because you were a, a young guy, but you remember when your father decided to take the risk on this ferry from New, Newport, Rhode Island, and bring it to Portland and have sure her. did. Well, he must have had some sleepless nights, because that's dicey stuff. Oh, yeah. Um, he stuck his neck out. But he, you know, he made most of his decisions from his gut. Yeah. Uh, he knew that. And he really didn't know. He hadn't traveled a whole lot at that point yeah. in his life. And, but he knew people were drawn to the water. And he literally was reading Boats and Harbors magazine uh, at our old restaurant across the street, thinking about the restaurant he'd build on the end of the pier. Uh, and then he saw this thing, and he just, the light bulb went off. It, he just looked at it as a platform or a foundation. Common sense. So he had a lot of it. So, uh, but he also had a lot at risk. He could have lost everything. My mom used to tell a funny story about, uh, he said to my mom one day, I'm thinking about, because he was established. He owned the, that whole block of buildings on the other side of Commercial Street, a successful business, real estate. And he bought Long Wharf, and he had built a marina. And he said to my mother, I'm thinking about buying this, uh, you know, this ferry, 206-foot long retired car ferry, and kind of mapped it out a little bit for her. And uh, what do you think? And she said, I don't know, Tony, that's a little big of a risk. He says, too late, I already bought it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the way he worked. Yeah, yeah. He never consulted us, you know, myself and my, my other family members. I, I shouldn't say. He was definitely driving the bus. It was his, he, he said, because uh, I asked him one day uh, when he came down the gangway and he kind of undid everything I had done that night. And I said, well, what does it mean when you say you're semi-retired? He said, as soon as I walk down the gangway, I'm the boss. He was the boss. He paid attention to everything, every detail. Mm -hmm. If you went into that restaurant and you saw your, and, and talked to your father, he would come to your table, talk to you. 
but his eyes oh, yeah. were everywhere. I always said he had eyes in the back of his head. He knew what was going on. He would say, excuse me a second, and yeah. go speak to somebody, yeah. say, don't do that or yeah. do this. Yeah. He, he was something. One time when I was managing partner of my law firm, we hired a new administrator to be the boss of our law firm. And the first day he came to work, I said, what are you doing tonight? Nothing. I said, you and your wife on us. Go down to DeMillo's restaurant, order whatever you want, drinks, whatever. Have a very good time on us. His first day at work. We only require one thing. He said, what's that? I said, watch DeMillo. <laughs> <laughs> Learn from him. Learn from watch the master. Watch <laughs> DeMillo. I said, that's the way we want you to be that's here. Good. So, yeah, he was a... Uh, he was a remarkable guy, and I like it that you have a painting of your father in the entryway to DeMillo's restaurant where he's looking <laughs> at his eyes, and it's the way I remember him, watching everything. He did. And when you walk by it, you <laughs> must think you. he's oh, watching yeah. you. We, we used to, I used to tell my brother Gene, he's looking at you and through that office window. Yeah. When some, some say he's looking at the cash register. But, uh, <laughs> That's right. He also said, uh, we live by the, when conflict might arise in our family management of the restaurant. And he said, uh, we live by the golden rule. I've got all the gold and I rule. <laughs> <laughs> Which was great. Yeah, yeah, this is great. Your father was young when he died. How old was 66. he? 66. 66. Lucky okay. strikes. Smoked all the time. My mother said his feet didn't touch the floor in the morning. He had one going. He yeah. loved smoking cigarettes. Yeah. And it, and it did him in. Oh. Yeah. Whatever. He had a good time while he was here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Steve, thank you very much for coming here. We learned a lot from you tonight. Uh, and people will now come into your restaurant. You know most of the people in town, but maybe some people here say, I saw you on television <laughs> and I've come in to have a meal. So thanks very much for coming. My Oops. pleasure. Bye-bye. Thank you.